Hello and welcome to Metacast and uh, this is your host Ilya Bezdilev and with me today is, oh, I'm with you today in your house, yeah. uh, So my co-host Arnab Dekov. We are both in sunny Vancouver today. We are and our CDO right there, yeah, you can hear probably once in a while. Our chief dog officer, Boomer. Yeah. yeah, so we are doing a company all hands and off-site uh, here uh, in, in person. It's got a lot to say. Yeah. Today we have uh, very special guests. Again, again, all of our guests are special, but these guys, uh, I discovered accidentally a friend of mine, uh, Prashant, he sent me a message. He's like, dude, check out this episode. And uh, it was a startup therapy episode titled The Toll Around the Founder, or The Toll Everyone Around the Founder Takes, or something like that. Yep. It was about um, the impact on children and spouses and friends and everybody around a startup founder. And the episode was really, really insightful. I think I listened to it two times. I shared it with Arunam right away. Yep. It was basically about uh, how hard it is for everybody and the founder, him or herself, yeah. to be... Uh, okay. so, sorry I, about that, I, I feel like we're kind of used to it at this point. If there's not a kid or a dog in the background, you're lying yep. about being at home. Yeah. We we're on we're on vacation right now, and we're staying with my uh, with my in laws, and so all three of my kids are running around here somewhere. Uh, we've got other company coming in, so it's likely to get rowdy on my end too. I wouldn't worry too yeah. much about it, guys. That's okay. all right. Okay. It's party. So today we have uh, Will and Ryan, uh, the hosts of Startup Therapy Podcast and the founders of uh, Startups dot com, and um, yeah, welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Good to be here. Can you guys introduce yourself a little bit and uh, maybe tell us what startups.com does? What do we do? Wow, yeah, very, very, very many things in the founder space. Like we, uh, like, let's give a little history lesson too while we're at it. So Will and I have been at this for a long time as, as and we're recording this without Zoom filtration on, you can see that we've been at this for a very long time. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't seen myself off Zoom cam in a while and apparently I have aged. Uh, it's not the vitamins <laughs> I'm taking, it's the Zoom filter. Yeah. Damn. Uh, but yeah, we've been doing this a long time. Uh, and I don't just mean startups.com. I mean, just like founder space in general. This has been, you know, this is, you know, Will and I both long term founders, um, but also long term helpers in the founder space. Like, this is what we love yeah. doing. We love talking to other founders, helping them through their problems, reflecting on our own, uh, you know, nothing like holding up the mirror uh, to see to see what's going on in your world. So, you know, we've consistently built tools, education, community, content um, around the founder space for the last, what are we at? Well, 12, 13 years now, getting up there. I was like, how old's my yeah, oldest? Yeah. Cause that's a good, uh -huh. that's a good benchmark. If I could remember Most that. By that by dog years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So like, is, is startups.com older than your oldest kid? Uh, just. Yeah. We, we <laughs> okay. both had our oldest kid at the same time. Yep. Okay. Not together. Yeah. Yeah, not together. Yeah, different, <laughs> different older kids and not together. Yeah, there, there, are, there are two older kids. Yeah. So we're going back uh, 11 plus years. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've stuck consistently to the to the North Star, which is we just want to be really helpful to founders uh, and, and make this uh, amazing journey that can also be really harrowing, really isolating, really stressful. A little less of those things and a little more of the the amazing. Um, and I think it's one of these things I keep finding myself repeating to founders a lot lately, which is fall in love with the the people you want to serve, uh, mm -hmm. fall in love with the the, the population you want to help, uh, get really really damn nerdy about their problems, and mm -hmm. get stuck in all of that. And then let the solution flow from there. I, I run into yeah. founders who they're like, I've got the solution. I'm going to go find a market and, and people that it'll help. And instead, right. you know, we've, we have lived that for at least the last, I mean, more than the last 12 years, but in this particular business, the last 11, 12 years, we've absolutely lived that ethos, which is we just love founders. They, and, and look, our, our inboxes, our phones, our, our, our Twitter threads, all of that will, will support and justify this. It's all we do. It's all we do. Yep. We just talk to founders and uh, it's been great. And, you know, they have no shortage of problems. So it's given us no shortage <laughs> of businesses to build. Hence, startups.com, fundable, clarity, biz plan, launch rock, all the rest. Right. So right, when you look right. at the portfolio, all geared towards that. So I think that's a, a decent history of, of what we've done and why. Uh, I, Ryan nailed it on, on kind of what we do. Uh, a little bit of background on the podcast for startup therapy. Uh, we initially, we we're going to do like a lot of people do a podcast that talks about how to build a startup. 
and we recorded some episodes, some very awkward episodes. I seem, I, I seem to recall, Ryan. <laughs> oh, man. And, and we were trying so to get bad. audio right. We we're trying to get topic right. Like I hated yep. the sound of my voice. Ryan sounds like a radio announcer, so he did not have this problem. And not like, in my head. Uh, <laughs> and, and so uh, we recorded a bunch of episodes that were like how to build a startup, and they were lame. They were just lame. Uh, because it was we talked like, about the weather. We had it yeah. scripted too. We were like, okay, so first be natural, be conversational. Will, how is the weather where you are today? It was fantastic. <laughs> that's exactly what that's exactly what we do. <laughs> and, and we were like, we're like, we're listening to this, like, damn, this is unlistenable. Like, this is yeah, shitty. This is and bad. so uh I had a bunch of other topics, you know, that, that we were gonna, gonna play around with. And then we started to play around with some topics, not about startups, but about founders. Yep. And so as, as you can imagine, startup therapy, had we redone that, it would have been called founder therapy. It right? would have been a little more, yep. more on brand. Um, but but that's, that's what was the genesis. And I think that's important for you know, other people building podcasts that sometimes that initial idea doesn't have to be the idea. I think that's similar to how startups work, where everybody thinks they have to have the perfect idea and the, and the perfect pacing out of the gate. And I'm like, no, yeah. that's yeah. just the seat. So we kind of ran with that. And we did an episode. And, and Ryan, it, it, if my memory serves me, we were about 220, 30 episodes, somewhere in that, yep. that uh, ballpark. 222 but later today, I think. If it wasn't the first episode, it was damn near it. We did an episode about how the first $250,000 uh, a founder makes is all the money in the world. Yep. And it was kind of where we started to really unintentionally debunk these myths, this, the, all these bullshit myths mm -hmm. about startups. Right where it's like, oh, you have to make a hundred million dollars or nothing. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> it's like, have you actually made two hundred fifty thousand dollars? It's a lot of money, and it's life changing. And and as we started to to do that, and we started to release those episodes, um, all of a sudden, uh, we started to get this really passionate feedback from people. Yeah. And that's really where we started to say, oh, damn, like this is a nerve. Yeah. And it became effortless for us. The topics we were talking about were things that we had lived personally, the ones that, that, that you guys have listened to, when we talked about the toll of all the people around you when you're building a startup, your, your, your spouse, your kids, your family, your friends, um, all of those are real experiences, right? We're, we're telling you exactly what we went through. Ryan and I both had our daughters uh, within what, the same year, right? Like six months. Yeah, three months apart. Yeah, different yeah, yeah. years, but yeah, yeah, it was it, it was only because it was a November and a January birthday. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. I just meant, I mean, uh, time wise. Um, yep. but literally the year that we started startups.com. Mm -hmm. and um, uh, that's where we started to learn firsthand the toll it takes. Like, hey, all of a sudden, I, I've got a kid to come home to. Yep. And when we started recording these episodes and covering really personal things, the reaction we got from other founders was like, "You're in my head." You're literally talking about the things that are in my head yeah. right now and, and that I'm not allowed to talk about in a lot of cases. I'm not allowed to express. Yeah. So that was the genesis for startup therapy. And, you know, a couple hundred episodes in, um, it's it's not hard to keep finding topics because the moment you talk to another founder, you got another topic. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It kind of yep. self-generates. Yeah. And I think the name is like super apt because that's the feeling I got the first time I was listening. I think it was the are bootstrapped uh, companies as valuable as uh, venture-backed ones? And I right. was like, wow, this is exactly like what I was thinking about, but also what I wanted to hear at this yeah. moment. Yeah, just yeah. to give some background to our listeners who might not have heard this episode. Yeah. Um, it's an episode about um, the kind of, the, the, I guess my biggest takeaway from there was there's actually a very small number of companies that get venture backing every year and an even smaller right. number of first time venture backed companies. Yep. But it's like, I, th I think the total number was 4,000 uh, that you mentioned and the total. first, first yeah. time. First yeah. time yeah. That, that includes like, second and third rounds too. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's everybody. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. But, but then, but then like, if you, if you, if you're in this area, right? So like we are, we were in big tech before. So if you're in the West coast, this is the only thing that it's, you it's think like, and like, see. It's yeah. like everyone in your yeah. dog gets funding, right? Yeah. <laughs> and like, if you're not getting funding, like you're, you're like you're nobody. You can't launch launch a company. Like in this whole kind of indie hacker movement, um, we actually had an episode about this. I'm like, yeah. indie hacker movement is just business. Yeah, yeah right. Old school way. <laughs> it's just right. Rebranded. It's, it's just called how most businesses are built, right? Like, yeah, like, exactly, historically. Yeah. Right. So, but you guys talking openly about that was really therapeutic in a way because yeah. you're like, okay. So I just didn't realize that the numbers were so small. Right. Um, well, that's the thing. It, you know, I, I got to tell you, I, I might have mentioned this in the episode, but um, 
uh, prior to moving back to Columbus, Ohio, where I live now, uh, I actually lived in Beverly Hills, California. And um, the, the one thing that always struck me um, while living there is how these are literally the, the wealthiest people on the planet, of which I'm not one of them, just to be clear. <laughs> just happen to be there. Um, but these are the wealthiest people on the planet. They can go anywhere they want, and they all cho you know choose to come there. It's beautiful in its own right. And they've never even heard of venture capital. Think about that for a second, right? Yep. Like this, this idea is that the only way you could get to that level is to go the VC track. And I'm like, I've never talked to so many people that could not give a shit about technology, venture capital, <laughs> <laughs> or rich as hell. Right? Right. And I'm kind of like, you know, I think we're, you know, we've got a little bit too much of a bubble situation going on. Mm -hmm. And then you zoom mm -hmm. out and you say, hey, if I'm not living literally in San Francisco, like you guys were talking about, and I go to any other town and I look at the people there that are well to do living amazing lives. What percentage of them have ever raised venture capital? And it's going to be like 0.00001%. And yeah, yet right. somehow I'm convinced it's the only way. It's, yeah, it's, a, right. it's a bullshit here. Right. So I wonder if uh, that perception is created by all of the venture backed startups talking about that everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And then I mean, it is press worthy. So, and yeah. that That's seems to amplify. Yeah. Exactly it. I, I just, I was on the phone yesterday with a journalist who was asking my opinion, and it wasn't wasn't to be published. It was just that uh, we were just having a conversation with a friend who happens to be a journalist in the startup space. Like, so, you know, what do you think about the funding crisis? And I was like, it's a really huge problem. It's massive. It is, it's, it's, it's unbelievably big deal for like the 0.5% of companies that applies to. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Right. And so then we talked about, well, so why does it seem like such a big deal? Because people slowly and, and carefully and stably building businesses in their homes or, or, or a co-working space isn't a news story, right? So right. it's exactly right. what you said, the press yep. were the aspect of it. So when we see things in the press, we have to remember they're there for a reason, not because yeah. they're important to us, worthy. but they're important yeah. to getting eyeballs on news stories that pay yeah. for advertising that employ yep. people who run newspapers. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Nothing yeah, yeah. to do with us. And like coming back to this topic, uh, you didn't go bootstrapping route the very first time, right? So tell us a bit about like, how did you land up in this space? Uh, because right now, I think a lot of what you're talking about is about this topic, the last yeah. few episodes. Uh, but initially, before startups.com, I think you raised uh, venture funding, you ran your startups and all that. So tell us like yeah. your journey, how did you land up on it? And what's the path? Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, uh, 30 years ago, I started one of the first web design companies. It's weird to say that, by the way, like when you say 30 <laughs> years ago, like that, like I, I sound like, you know, many moons ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, that was like circa 94, 93, 94. And um, at the when time, Marquis, the internet... Marquis on web pages were a thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, well, no, actually, you know, it's funny. We hadn't got that far yet. Like, yeah, like that, that would come later. Like, yeah. like, that would be a massive. Like, I remember when the blink tag was introduced and minds <laughs> yeah. were blown. Like, we were like, ah, how are we going to leverage this technology? <laughs> it's incredible. Um, and, and just actually, it's just a, a fun bookmark at this time. <clears throat> at that time, I was a student at The Ohio State University, a theater major, actually, had nothing to do with business. Um, and I went to my guidance counselor in arts and sciences to drop out. And she was so terrified. She's like, oh, my God, what's going wrong? And I'm like, are you kidding? I can't wait to drop out. She's like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm going to start an internet company. And she's like, what's the internet? What's the I internet? I mean, right. you got to figure yeah. there was a time, right? There was a yeah. time. Um, so that's how far back that actually was. It was before people actually had heard of the internet yet. So, right. so that said, uh, that was a bootstrap company. We were essentially just a design agency. We were building some of the first web pages on the internet. Um, and, and we grew that really quickly. We grew that to about a $700 million company, uh, bootstrapped and sold it in 2001. Even that was a long time ago. Damn, that was over 20 years ago. Yep. That's it. It's, it's all a long time ago. You weren't working with each other at that time though, right? Yeah. So, you know, around the same time, uh, that was building that agency, I, I was building an agency of my own. Um, they did not get nearly as big. It was also bootstrapped, but we, we barely left the boots. I think we did buy, I think we did buy some shoes with Velcro on them at some point. That was kind of as far as <laughs> we got, uh, but it was such a crazy time. And I mean, I, I think that there's, you know, we can look at some analogs, you know, crypto brought one of these times around. It did what it did. Um, the internet stuck around in a different way so far. Uh, you know, AI is now doing its thing, but it was such a crazy time to be building a company. Um, and also like, and I, I think this is probably true for you as well, Will, venture capital was not on my mind 
at that time, raising money was not on my mind at that time. Also, mm -hmm. like as an 18 year old in university, um, it, it, I probably wouldn't have gone well if I had tried, uh, but it wasn't part <laughs> of the dialogue. Certainly not. Where I was also I was also at, at, at the Ohio State University at the time, and it was not part of the zeitgeist. People weren't talking about funding. People weren't talking about investors at that level. Right. Investors yep. were, yep. you know, old people that, that sat around pounding tables and, and, and talking about the price of copper, as far as I understood. Right. Right. Um, right they right. were not involved in the stuff that I was doing, which was explaining to people like Will was what the hell the internet was, why it was important. Um, my favorite anecdote from that period of time was talking to somebody who was a high level executive at a very large company about the importance of the internet. And he goes, oh yeah, hang on. I've got that here in my, and gets into a desk drawer and pulls out an AOL uh, 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 floppy. It wasn't even a CD at that point. I'm like, <laughs> Yep, you yeah, got the it. Internet say you that totally get out, it. He would he would pull a print out of an email or something. <laughs> uh, if he knew how to print an email, he might have. <laughs> okay. sure. yeah. If you saw my agency presentation in 1994, I kid you not, the presentation went like this. In 1960, in the 1960s, there was something called the DARPA net, which was a defense network. And I had to like literally explain to how this came to yep. be, right? right. Because and then like my next thing would be, this is called a web page. It goes on something called a web browser, which you use on your computer. You gotta understand, people still didn't all have computers no, by this right, point. Right? No. <laughs> like, like, so my bad. secretary has one of those things. That's exactly what yep. it was. Like people would, like the CEOs would have their secretary come in and show them how to use a computer so that they could use the internet. Like, and these are like majorly paid mm -hmm. executives, right? right? We had major brands. Yep. Uh, it, was, it was a fun time. Yeah, from there, what what happened next? Uh, what were the next few companies? How did you? Like, oh, sure. Basically, your journey up to startups.com. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll give you the condensed version. But uh, <laughs> after that, in 2001, I started eight more companies. Uh, the last three were venture backed companies. And essentially what I did is I started an incubator. Uh, but mm -hmm. the ideas were just my ideas. I just had a million ideas in a million different industries. We did everything from an online uh, car lease exchange called Swapalease to uh, online casting for every show on television called GotCast, which is what brought me to Los Angeles, um, to um, essentially what a firm is now, a company called Affordit, which was turning retail purchases in 2007 into monthly payments or weekly payments, um, 10 years ahead of where it should have been. Um, and out of that, uh, companies that we own now, like Fundable and BizPlan and what became startups.com, um, were all kind of uh, generated out of that. The last one I did, uh, the last startup before startups.com, was a company called unsubscribe.com, which again, these, it's so funny when I talk about these things. There was a time where you couldn't unsubscribe from email. People right. don't remember that, right? right? But, but that actually did exist. Right. And, uh, and me and a guy named Jamie Simonoff, who started Ring, uh, the doorbell company, uh, started unsubscribe.com. I told him about this ridiculous idea I had on a Sunday morning while eating my chocolate Pop-Tarts that I always had a folder, and I think it was my Yahoo, I'm sure it was my Yahoo, um, <laughs> that I that was called unsubscribe. And I said, all I do is, is as I get junk mail, I move them to the unsubscribe folder, and then I spend my Sunday mornings going through and trying to figure out how to get off all these uh, emails. I was like, imagine if we could automate that. Email's the largest problem there is, as far right. as like total addressable market. And he loved it, and you know, and we we raised some some money for it, and uh, sold it years ago. Um, but that was my last thing. And then startups.com, uh, Ryan and I um, were very early together, uh, eleven years ago. So it's been a minute. It's the longest thing I've ever done. So you both kind of knew each other a little bit, and uh, decided yeah, to yeah, work yeah, together at that days. time. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I'm curious. I'm curious with the you know venture back company and uh, bootstrap company. Because you guys um, like to talk about how, I think the question you asked in one of the episodes is, who do you create value for? Like yeah. the question you need to ask yourself, right? <clears throat> so how was it different when you had uh, a venture back company unsubscribe uh, versus, you know, with your bootstrap companies? Were there any sort of decisions or situations where you would be like, oh gosh, <laughs> I didn't take the funding? Or maybe the other way around? The differences are subtle. Right. It's kind of like if you've ever had a steak that's done like perfectly medium rare and you've ever eaten a live earthworm, it's it's that type of subtlety. <laughs> right. Like it's it's nearly the same thing, depending on where you grew up. Uh, yeah, that. no, it's it, I'll, I'll, I'll let Will go from here. But I, I've got my thoughts, too. There's there's more more than a few differences. 
Yeah, we've got hundreds of hours in this topic. Um, so here's what was interesting. I think folks will appreciate this. You guys will appreciate this. When I was running unsubscribe.com, affordit.com, godcast.com, which were all venture-funded companies, I was running them all at the same time. Hmm. So, so these weren't like, uh, I, I started them in successive years, but I was running them in parallel. I was also running a few bootstrapped companies at the same time, what became bizplan, what became fundable.com, what became startups.com. So I was kind of running, call it like three bootstrapped companies. At the same time, I was running three venture-funded companies. Now, what's bizarre about that is that you, you're you basically living like six different lives yeah. at the same time, right? So imagine that um, th this was this was a, a version of you as a human, right? And you had six different versions of your life every day. It's, it's you, but you have a, a different wife, a different yeah. spouse, n kids, not kids, you're single, you're, you're I mean, like, like totally different versions of your life all happening at the same time. So here's what would happen. We'd call a, a VC. And we'd be like, I've got this amazing new idea. It's called unsubscribe.com, blah, blah, blah. And that VC would be like, that is amazing. I will have a check to you tomorrow. And literally, literal words, right? Same call the next day, different company. I've got this other company called gotcast.com, right? Not a chance. We have no interest whatsoever. <laughs> like, right. Dude, I'm the same guy. Right. Right. So it, it, it was this weird parallel experience, also easily the most unhealthy experience of my life. Um, it's this weird parallel experience where um, you start to realize that that you aren't the only factor, right? The timing, the yeah. business, the market, all of these other variables right. are all things that, frankly, you don't have as much control over as you think. We try to. Like, oh, if I just have the best idea, then it'll just go fine. Dude, I had plenty of good ideas, right? And I, I ran them all at the same time, and they did not all go the same way. <laughs> they right. went dramatically differently. So, uh, so uh, I want to hear Ryan's take on the bootstrap versus VC side. I'll tell you that having run six lives in parallel, um, it taught me a lot, which set us up for startups.com. I feel like I should probably drop a disclaimer right now around like, this is not how we recommend running a business. And you should not like this is like pharmaceutical <laughs> level, like, you know, this could cause these side effects, right? Including weight gain, hair right loss, me. right? Stroke. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So look, the there are so many differences. I mean, we've we've touched on on various aspects of this across an, a number of, of startup therapy episodes. I think the 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 main one for me was that I started to realize that with every decision I made within an, in a company that had investors in the cap table, that all of a sudden you had all of these other voices in your head, or at least perspectives that you felt some responsibility for considering and whatever decision got made. Let me let me give a really simple example here. When you go out and you, you want to you want to figure out what's for dinner, it's just you. You just think about mm -hmm. what do I want for dinner? What do I need to do? All right? What I, you know, this sounds good. Tacos sound great. I'm going to go grab tacos. Right? Yep. Now, I have a family of five, um, well, actually a family of six because my father lives with us. So when I have to think about what dinner looks like, that that decision became <laughs> infinitely more complicated, right? Ah, we should have tacos. Uh, Jack's allergic to shrimp. Uh, we should have spaghetti. Uh, Hannah doesn't want to eat carbs right now, right? Like there's just all of these things that get involved. And so you end up with all of these, these weird um, variables thrown into your decision-making matrix that wouldn't have otherwise been there, right? If it was just you making decisions, um, and you will and I have talked about this a number of times in the podcast, but it's about having that optionality and being mm -hmm. able to run the business, not just the way you want to for, for the arbitrary sake of being able to say, it's just me, I wanna do it my way, right? It's not about that. It's about being able to say, this is what I believe is the critical path right now. I want to follow that and I wanna do it this way for these reasons. The second you've got investment dollars in there, the second you're beholden to other people and you've narrowed the allowable outcomes, it completely yeah. changes your decision making framework. And so for me, that was always the hardest part when I was like, well, I could do this, uh, but that's going to impact the investors this way or that's going to change the pace to 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 next round of capital or yep. that's going to impact our ability to, to hire the way we wanted to, to be able to meet the growth needs. All of a sudden, you just got all these other variables thrown into the mix. And so for me, that was the the, the heaviest piece, right? In yeah. look, there's a lot of aspects that are that are that are really challenging. There's a lot of differences. The amount of stress you go through just to raise the funds cannot be overlooked, right? That yeah. impacts your health, your sanity in the startup. Uh, but again, for me, it was about the ongoing lingering effect of just 
having other decision makers either actively or just passively because I couldn't get them out of my head in the in the matrix. If we talk about that, um, when, when I was running three companies at the same time that were all venture funded compared to the bootstrap, yep. the bootstrap companies, you focus solely on your customer, you focus exactly. solely on revenue because yep. that's all that matters. That's it. The moment you have investors, you focus on them first yeah. because yeah. they're your lifeblood. Exactly. Right. right? And in their whims, in your ability to raise more capital, like people don't take this seriously enough. But at which point the money's coming from investors, they are your customer. Right. And so all of your decisions and, and, and all of your outcomes are based on them. Yep. Right. And so you get into this, this vicious cycle where um, everything that you do is like, well, how will investors feel about this? And it's a bunch yeah. of bullshit because <laughs> you start doing things where you're like, oh, if we release this feature that's now AI, investors will be interested in it. Yep. And it's like, okay, we would have literally never done that, right? Because yeah. it takes um, your focus away from like the customers and the product. Yeah. Yep. I can, I can yep. see parallels we yep. work to work in the big company where uh, well, your customer is your manager <laughs> and, yeah. and their customer right. is, is right. their manager, which is like LPs in, uh, yeah. in, yep. in the VC case. Yeah. Were there any decisions that you made, uh, maybe like some examples, that you wish you did differently, but you did it the way you did because you had investors? You know, it's weird. Um, in the three times that I raised the, uh, raised capital for each of those companies, um, uh, the seed rounds, you know, the, the first rounds, um, they all came together surprisingly quickly. And so, and, and by the way, that's unusual. And it was also a very unusual time. This is like heading into through the financial crisis. Yeah. It wasn't a great time to be raising capital, right? Um, and I had never raised capital before. It, my, my previous companies, I just bootstrapped them all. So I didn't raise capital until I got to like my fourth or fifth company. Um, and it just so happened that there was a guy that I knew that, that ran a venture fund that always wanted to invest in something I was doing. And I met with him, told him what I was doing. This was gotcast.com, the, the online casting company. And he's like, yeah, here's a term sheet um, for exactly what you want an evaluation that's even good by today's standards, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, oh, well, you mean I don't have to use my own money again? I was like, well, that sounds cool, right? And it is cool. Um, and, but, but what I hadn't learned yet, and I would, is that I'm now, he's now my customer. Yep. All I care about is serving him. Right. And if I somehow also help my actual customers, bonus. Right. Right. And in and, and that really uh, affected me. It took me a long time to understand that. Right. Um, everybody thinks that it'll change. They think, oh, well, I'll raise some money and then I'll go get customers and it'll be all about customers. It just, that never actually happens. Yeah. It right. sounds cool. It never actually happens. Right. Uh, and so that was a huge lesson through doing both. If you were to like go back, would you try and bootstrap those three companies also? What were the outcomes and how would that have like changed it significantly? Sure. Um, so let's see, uh, two of them we sold, one of them uh, just faded out. Uh, and they were both uh, like seed stage fundings, like like million, two million, like nothing crazy, like, you know, when people do lots and lots of rounds. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the first one was, um, I'm trying to get the order, it was Godcast. Um, that one we ended up selling to a private group that was useless. Um, the second one was afford it. That was probably one of the best business ideas I've ever had because again, it was a firm in Klarna 10 years before a firm in Klarna. Yeah. Um, but the problem is that it was a firm in Klarna 10 years before a firm in Klarna. Like it was, it was way ahead of its time. Also right in the middle of uh, the financial crisis. You want a cool time to be raising money for a, a high risk consumer finance company? Do it while every bank is <laughs> melting down. <tap. laughs> yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a popular thread. If they're trying to raise for crypto right now. Right. Um, and so, so by comparison, um, <clears throat> uh, the money came relatively easy for each of those. When we did unsubscribe, when, when Jamie and I and my other partner, Josh, uh, did unsubscribe, we raised our money in 48 hours. Uh, it was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. Um, so, so, so when I say the raises came easily, um, with Afford It, we raised the first round relatively easily. But boy, when we went to go do the second round, it was lights out. It, I mean, mm -hmm. we pitched for a year and a half yeah. every single day, three to five VCs a day. I, I've been to every office on Sand Hill Road and then some, right? And we had, uh, we had 80 uh, investor meetings. Right, which is a lot. Oof. I'm saying 80 firms, yeah. not not just uh, 80 meetings. Many meetings per firm, and within those, we had 25 partner pitches. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the significance of a partner pitch, 
the cadence is, is simply this. You meet with either an associate or usually a low-level person first. They vet you. They then bring you to a single partner. They vet you. And they kind of say to their whole partnership, hey, I think this is a worthy investment. Let's have this company come in, pitch the whole partnership. And most VC partnerships say that they have to invest in unison. If one person disagrees, right. they won't do it. We had, you're lucky if you get a couple of those. That's like the final Shark Tank showdown. We did 25, right? Um, and got eviscerated across the board. We were, <laughs> we were so toxic for that moment in time. I might as well have been selling um, credit default swaps that year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was so bad. Iceland uh, was still in the market. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, so so we got crushed uh, on final fundraise, which is really where that thing died. It was a great business model, though. So while you were doing all that fundraising, um, what, what was the company doing? I mean, like, I, I, I suppose you were busy, you know, you were on the road all the time. Like, how many people were working? Like, what were they doing? How you, were you paying them? The, these were early small teams. So these are like five to 10 person teams, you know, because you're still only in the seed round. And we weren't thinking in terms of how do we spend as much money as possible. But as Ryan will tell you, um, I'm very involved, right? Like at startups.com, I'm writing our copy. I'm doing product management. I'm our CFO. I, I, I wear a lot of hats, as does Ryan, Yep. right? Um, the way it goes, Ryan. And yeah, th th there, there is no management at our company. Like we're all busy doing shit. <laughs> Right. And so with these companies, I'm not like some figurehead that had the idea and ran off. Like I'm helping uh, like do marketing. I'm helping helping with writing copy. I'm writing emails. I'm writing everything. I was probably right. in I the basement of our office running Cat5 cabling to increase the networking <laughs> in the sales room, right? Like right. we got our hands dirty a lot. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I think that's um, one of the challenges is trying to raise. You went through, like you said, every day you had a VC meeting. That takes your focus away from the stuff that your product and your customers need into stuff that you need to raise the next round and the next round. Yeah, it does. Yeah, there's so many distractions involved with with fundraising, right? The 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 physical time spent is one of them. The just the fact that you're now emotionally spending energy um, in other places, right? The the yeses are great. The the rejections are not. Um, so you're all over the place, right? It is. Yeah. It's a it's a gambit that you run through, and you come out the other end a different person, right? You know, sometimes right. with money, sometimes without. Uh, but yeah, it's it's hard to go through that process unscathed, and uh, you know. Raising money in 48 hours, to Will's point, very, very unusual um, and uh, a, a hard to hard to replicate uh, move. Most people struggle through that period, right? I mean, right. Let's, let's also remind ourselves that most people who set out to raise funding don't actually get there, right? right? So there's also all the people who were trying to raise funds uh, and didn't. And so think about that, right? So now, not only have you faced the distractions, um, the, 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 the time spent, all of that, you now don't have the money. And even more sadly now, you have what's probably a false negative around the viability of your business. Just because investors didn't want to invest in it, now you're going, this thing probably doesn't have legs. This isn't gonna work. It's not, it doesn't, it's not, it's not a good business. It wasn't right. a good business for them, right? Go back right. to the question you asked us at the beginning of this segment, which is who are we creating value for? Investors right. look at a business to understand, is it going to make me money? They don't look at it right. and go, is this a good business? They'll say that. They'll be like, ah, oh, we found a good business last week, right? What they mean is a business that they think will put money in their right. pocket, right? right? Will and I joke about this one all the time. Investors will say things like, oh, it's a lifestyle business. Right. Yeah, no shit. Like that's, yeah, of, of course it is. Ideally. Right? Of course it's a lifestyle ideally. business. <laughs> I hope, hopefully, right? I, I was laughing with somebody the other day. I was saying, you know, look, next time somebody hears that, they should just high five their co-founder, walk out of the room and be like, we got all the confirmation we need. We don't need their money. We can go build a great lifestyle business without <laughs> yep. them. Cool. Right. Right. Yeah. So um, you were also talking about, you know, the first 250K being the most important uh, money you ever make. And I think one of your episodes, you said that you guys had to do some agency work or contract work while you were building startups.com mm -hmm. to fund the business. So can yeah. you talk a bit about... Uh, how you actually do that? Because actually we might be in a similar situation uh, in a few months, uh, maybe more, I guess, like eight or nine months. If we don't make enough <clears throat> revenue from our startup, the, you know, I, I, we don't want to go back to corporate jobs. So we, we, would rather, we would rather do some contract work, maybe some education work. Um, so I guess, yeah, tell us your story, how you did it. Uh, like how do you find customers? Yeah, what advice you can give to founders like us? 
Yeah. So look, I this is one of my favorite things to talk about. In fact, if you're out building a product, um, it, and you can always build a service, right? If you're thinking uh, long term, what I need this to be is a piece of software, something that that's going to do whatever, right? Find a way to run that as a service today, because if you can run it as a service proxy, you can start making money right now, right? Make it something that's an on ramp for the product later down the road. So I think it it comes down to like thinking about what what it is you want to build, right? So go back to what I was saying at the beginning of the episode around falling in love with that, the person you want to solve it for. Uh, fall in love with the problems they have. Don't fall in love with your solution. If you think your solution is a piece of software, cool. Let's validate the hell out of that and let's make money along the way by running that as a service until we get to the point where it's a viable product. You're also going to build a better product, right? Mm -hmm. Ryan's three Ps of great product are proven proprietary process. Right. If you can nail that through service, you're going to build a better product. And if you don't, you're going to end up with Ryan's least favorite P in all of product, the pivot. Right. This is where we end up having to now change direction. Why? The pivots, you know, this this word that we've 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 made sound very nice in the startup space. But if you translate, if you look in the dictionary, what it says is built the wrong shit first. That's all it means. <laughs> right. We just built the wrong thing first. So I digress, but yes. So when when we're building out anything, so we looked at our business early on. Will you'll remember this well? Um, we launched Fundable mm -hmm. in 2012. We were just we built product. We we're sitting around waiting for Obama to sign the the Jobs Act into existence. Uh, the minute that pen hit the the table on C-SPAN, we hit launch, and off we went to not much fanfare, <laughs> right? We had people coming in, yeah. like, don't get me wrong. There are people like, okay, we can go crowdfund. All right, people showed up. Um, it was kind of like opening an innovative new gym that nobody had ever been into before. And they had no idea how to work out on the equipment. Yeah. They're like, do I hold this above my head? Do I put this on my foot? Like, why does my back hurt so much? They had no idea what they were doing. And so we quickly realized we needed a service component to what we were doing that would not only augment the product, but would augment our revenue in the short term. Um, and then that went very well, very early. That turned into a seven figure line of business very quickly, where we were able to really help people to utilize the technology that we just built. Oh, interesting. So I think, yeah, I think when you do something that's, you know, either B2B or it's like a high check uh, kind of product uh, where um, you don't have to have like 10 million, you know, customers paying you five bucks a month, right? So, but you have maybe like a few thousand paying you $500 a month, then I yep. think you can definitely do that. Um, what yeah. are your thoughts about the consumer product where, sure. uh, let's, say, let's say it's an app, right? Like, like we can't provide uh, a podcast app as a, as a service to someone. Like it, like it has to be an app. So nope. there's a certain point, like, like, like we have to ship it, right? And then, yeah, like, like uh, what, you, what, what, you actually, are... what you're trying to do right now is, uh, I mean, what you've done, we actually we just uh, published a book about starting a podcast. So there you that go. kind of, we, we tried to generate revenue through mm -hmm. that. Uh, but we're also thinking about maybe some additional things, uh, maybe doing some like consulting for uh, kind of, I guess, companies of, I guess, I don't know, lower caliber than Amazon, maybe teaching product management and again, software development, this kind, this kind of things. Um, but this is not related to the podcasting app that we are right. working on. That would be a distraction just to... Uh, you know, get you know what's more distracting? Get the you know what's more distracting? Running out of cash <laughs> and having to shut down your startup. Okay, so True. put it in the grand scheme of yeah. things. Get the priorities right here, guys. If the if the priority is to make the runway extend off to infinity point, where like mm. we can just go as long as we want, there's nothing that's a meaningless distraction. Right. As long as you're still getting some time to work on the startup, or even no time for a period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, Will and I joke about this all the time. Startups don't run out of money. Startups don't die. They don't need roofs over the head. Uh, they don't even need the servers that they exist on because you could offload it and then put it back later, right? They can they can just sit and wait for you. It, um, the minute you start to have trouble, it's a different story. But so something you were saying a second ago is 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 an important point, right? And I think this is where particularly people who come from a technical background get a little trapped in their own thinking, which is like, at some point we have to ship it. At, at some point, sure, right? But you're thinking about the technical solution to the problem. If you think about the people that you want to help, go back to what I was saying about just get myopically focused on the population and then think about the problems they have, then look for the ones that most align with what you want to do. You can usually find overlap there. I'm saying even if you can't, it's cool. If you've got to go drive around in an, on the wrong side of Uber, right, as receiving the money, not paying, you got to be on the wrong side of Uber making money to run your startup. Okay. Right. But if you can find something that does dovetail into. So if instead of consulting on on product, if you could maybe find 
product company, so you have some relevance and consult on podcasting, for example, or something else, something that's relevant to your market. Mm. Um, but you touched on another big one, which is is content, right? So you said we wrote a book, right? What's the name of the book? It's called The Pragmatic Podcaster. <laughs> I like this. Uh, that was not Will and I in the beginning. We're like, how do we make this as technically complicated as possible so that we'll never want to keep one of our episodes? Um, we got over it, finally. Um, but we were less than pragmatic. So you can you can simply start with content. You can start with community has become a really big thing and people are, are more and more inclined to pay for access to communities to get answers to the questions they have. Again, like if you know there's somebody out there running a community who cares all day long about you, who cares all day long about the problems that you suffer from, where better to hang out to, to forward your journey? And so sometimes that means aiming a little bit upper funnel, right? Going kind of earlier stage people who maybe aren't exactly the fit user for your, your final product, but guess what you're doing the entire time? You're helping to move along that chunk of the population to get them closer and closer so you can act as an on-ramp for your own product, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't always work out that way, but these are the explorations I'm always going through as I'm, I'm thinking about our own businesses, I'm thinking about how to help other founders, which we do all day, every day. This is the calculus that's playing out in my head. How can <clears> we build <throat> a good on-ramp that works for us now, keeps us moving in the startup, and helps to, to kind of age our population towards utility within whatever the product we want to build at some point is. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious how you guys uh, came up to the startups.com idea because you were just talking about communities, right? And the startups.com is about communities. So yeah, what's, what's, what's the origin story of that? Uh, like, how did you just decide to like, okay, so this is what we are gonna do. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about this. Uh, Ryan, you'll appreciate this. The origin story was me having a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> like literal heart attack? Pretty much. Um, wow. My heart's <laughs> stopping. Um, so uh, in the early, early days, um, I was still running those five plus companies. And um, yeah. in, in one of those was what was going to become fundable, right? Like we were kind of developing that and biz plan harder, harder existed, et cetera. And, uh, in, and Ryan uh, and myself and a couple other people uh, were at lunch together. And I remember telling you, Ryan, I was like, dude, I don't feel right. And I was 30, I was yeah. 37 years old, so good. right? Um, my daughter had, let's see, let me get that right. My daughter had just been born. Um, we had just uh, moved back to Columbus again. Uh, we've done this back and forth a couple times. We just moved back from Columbus. We'd, we had been running five companies. We had been uh, growing companies, failing companies, like doing everything you possibly can. I had like every life event you could possibly have at exactly the same time. Let's just put it that way. Uh, getting married, like whatever. <laughs> so anyway, I'm like, hey man, I don't feel right. Uh, I go, I hop in my car, and I was going to drive home. And Ryan, you remember, I only lived five minutes from the office. Yep, didn't make didn't it. Didn't make it. And I'm cruising up the street. I, I, I hop on my phone. I, I call my wife, and I'm like, babe, I don't feel right. And as soon as I said that, almost like on command, my heart stopped. Uh, by the way, you can't not notice when your heart stops. That's not something where it's like, oh, that, feel, that feels kind of weird. No, you're kind of dead, right? And also, the whole body goes limp. <laughs> by the way, I'm behind the wheel of my car on a highway. Right. Yeah. Not also yeah. not a great time. Right. So um, I end up coming to regaining control of the car. And because I'm an idiot, I drive home. Right. <laughs> I crawl out of my car. Ryan, this always reminds me of Wolf of Wall Street when he's like crawling out of his car. Right. And, and I'm like, I crawl into yeah. my yeah. Uh, yeah. living room and I call you guys. Right. I think I called you. And I was like, dude, you guys need to come get me. And because you guys are idiots, you took me to a minute clinic. Uh, like the the, the, <laughs> the least likely place to resuscitate. You weren't bleeding. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and they're like, they put me on the EKG, EKG and whatever. They're like, dude, you need to go to the hospital like right now. What are you even doing here? And so next thing I know, uh, I'm, I'm in the emergency room. Um, uh, short version of it. And I think this is important to folks listening. Uh, I had a massive crippling panic attack, which I had never had before in my mm -hmm. life. Um, and it. You had, you had, you had you, you, while this was happening or after? No, that's no, what, this that's is, what the, this the heart the attack that's was. That's what the right. precipitating, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. The, yeah. it was the panic. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was my heart seizing for, for long enough for, uh, for things to not yeah. be cool. Um, and when people think panic attack, if you're not, most people have had them, especially if you're a founder by now, I would learn this later. Um, but if you haven't had them before, you don't think much of it. Oh, I guess he was just nervous. No, <laughs> it's when your body is like, I can take no more. Like there's just nothing left. We're yeah. shutting this, this party down. Anyway, the reason I, I tell you that story is because at that moment, that was the game changer for me where I was like, okay, uh, 
I can't just go do this again. I can't like reset, you know, in, like, and my wife was like, you're doing all of these things, all these companies, whatever, because you can, meaning you're willing to put the time and the effort into it, not because yeah. you should. And in truer words yeah. were never spoken, mm -hmm. right? And, and so anyway, so I ended up taking some, some time and be like, what do I want to do here? And a couple of things really resonated with me. And Ryan and I have talked about this, this stuff at length on, on, on our Startup Therapy podcast. Um, one of those was, what don't I ever want to do again? Again, again, when people are thinking about what's the business idea, et cetera, they think it's just about the business. It's about yep. your life and how you want to live it next because this is supposed to be setting you up for the life that you want. And that should be part of the DNA of this company. It's not just about, do we have a cool business idea? And so I tried to think of all the things that I'd want it to be. And then something struck me because it was, that was hard to do. Why don't I list all the things I don't want it to be? And Ryan, do you remember when we were sitting in the conference room? We started to list these things. <laughs> and we, we yep. were like, I can still see number three, don't work with assholes. <laughs> exactly, like it was, it was literally exactly. written on the board. I can still, I probably have a, I probably have a, a, a screen cap of it somewhere, but yeah, it was on the board. No, and, and, and I know that sounds obvious. And you're like, of course I wouldn't want to work with assholes. Try doing it. Try doing it and raising yeah. money, by the way. <laughs> Good luck with yeah, that. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> right, right. Good luck with that. Um, and so we listed, we started to list all these things that we never wanted to do again, right? For example, we never wanted our company to prevent us, right, from being able to spend time with our family. Not that we don't have to work. We have to yep. work. One of those things were like 12 years later, I meet my kid, right? Like not, not like that. Yeah. Right. And no lack of founders have had to make those sacrifices. And that's definitely where, where I was headed. Ryan, that may have been where you were headed. Elliot, our, you know, our other partner, um, that's definitely where he was headed. Um, so startups.com wasn't just about there's a market opportunity, which I'm going to explain in a second. It was about we need to change our lives permanently. And it took us every bit of 11 years to get here. It didn't just start magically where I guess we don't work with people we don't like. And I guess we get to do what we want. I guess we get to see it. Every day we were like, is what we're doing working toward that goal? If so, it's good. If not, raising capital, bad. Now, we always give this disclaimer, by the way. We spent a lot of time on this podcast kind of knocking investors. You know we run a fundraising platform for investors, right? right. <laughs> like, yeah, I should right. make that yeah. clear, right? right. Like, I, it, it, this isn't some anti stuff. Um, but we're just right. if you go to your website startups.com I think that's one of the more front and center things you will see yeah. as like a call out like if you want to do yeah. this join yeah, yeah 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 so, um yeah so yeah. but but here was the other part of it and Ryan talked to this a moment ago he, he mentioned the you know love your customer I know personally I sat around and I said if I could do anything on a Saturday this was the exercise if I could do anything on a Saturday I had unlimited amounts of money and I could spend my time any way I wanted to spend it how would I spend it and then how do I make that my job? Turns out, here's how I spend yeah. my Saturdays, sitting around bullshitting with founders. Most of my friends are founders, not because of startups.com. They were founders before startups.com. So anyway, so I started to think about it and I'm like, how, how am I spending my time with these founders? What am I talking to them about? Like, how is that part of kind of who I am or what I care about? And it turned out that if I could have a job, and I know Ryan feels the same way, where we just sit around and bullshit with founders all day, is somehow get paid for it. We don't even know how, it actually doesn't even matter how we get paid for it, it right? Matter. But if yeah. that's actually what we do every day, um, exactly having this conversation that the group of us are having right now, and that's our job, dude, uh, whatever it has to be. And it turned out that was our North Star. Our North Star is how do we just sit around helping founders all day? It didn't start with what's the market opportunity, what's the product, or anything else like that. Our problem statement at startups.com became this simple. There are 40 million startups started every year worldwide. Zero of them know what they're doing. That's our problem statement. No <laughs> one knows what they're doing, right? Yeah. And, 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 and because yeah. of that, we we're like anything we could do to help on this journey with funding, with customer acquisition, with mentorship, with peer networking is gonna be a net positive. And over time it changes, right? Like, like the form factor of how we need to help startups is gonna change. I don't care, right? Because so long as I'm sitting around bullshitting with founders all day, I'm golden. Yep. That was the journey. Yeah, we seem to keep inventing new problems at record pace. So there's no shortage of work <laughs> to be done. Yeah, it was it was such an amazing realization to know that, you know, there were these things that we had experienced as in our own founder journeys, some of which were absolutely amazing um, and some of which were not right. Like having to stuff Will into the back of a car. Um, to, <laughs> 
I have to go back to that story for a second. There, there was this hysterical moment where, because we had, we had laid him out across the back seat horizontally, right? Mm -hmm. Elliot on one side, I on the other. We both started to buckle him in. Elliot was buckling in his feet and I was buckling his torso. And we looked up at each other and we're like, I, I guess that's what we do. Like, I, I don't know. Like we're just, <laughs> <laughs> like, but so there were, there were a lot of things that, you know, when, when you look at the, at the founder journey, there's so many common experiences, right? And a lot of them are wonderful, but a lot of them are not. And while there were tons of people out there teaching you how to be really good at being a founder, how to be good at growing your business, there weren't enough voices out there telling you how not to do it. Right. Basically like, so like you say, like, here's how to be good at product. Here's how to be good at marketing. Here's how to be good at this. What about here's how not to be bad at your health. Here's how not to be bad Imagine at your that. relationships. Here's how not to be bad. Right. And we saw that this was actually when, when you came down and, and started to check the balance on most founders, that there was so much weight on both sides of the fulcrum in terms of things that they were doing well and things that they weren't. And that it wasn't that hard to shift that balance. That there were just so many more things that they were doing. They had all these opposing forces in their founder lives. And that just became something that we really wanted to impact, not just to make you a better at building a business, which that's cool too, right? We want them to build great businesses, but not at the expense of their personal relationships, not at the expense of their health, not at the expense of their emotional health, right? So I think that became, again, just going back to this whole notion of when you really, really love your customer, when you really love the person that you want to help, everything becomes easy. Now, in our cases, we also had personal experience because we were also our own customers, right? So we were also right. fixing the problem of not needing to go pick Will up by the roadside, stuff him into a car and take him to a minute clinic and hope everything was going to be okay, right? It worked out, but, you know, could have gone the other way and we wouldn't be on this podcast right now. Mm -hmm. well, at least Will wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm available. Will, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's, 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 it's such a fun story to go back through and think about how we got here. And I mean, it goes all the way back, you know, for both of us starting businesses really young, um, you know, facing all those challenges, not having the type of support that we wanted. And at a time where you just couldn't even go out and find it either. Like at least now you go read a blog post about it. Mm -hmm. Not that that's a great answer to a lot of these existential questions that we face. Um, but it was better than like going like, oh, I'm having an existential crisis as a founder. Let me go to the library, look in the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> okay, there's a book on accounting. Yeah. Maybe that'll help me feel Starting better. Starting your small business, imprint 1975, sweep. Exactly. That'll help, right? Tight so, knowledge. You know, big part of this was just us wanting to build the treehouse we didn't have as kids. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it was like, what are all the resources? What's the support? What's the, what are the things that we didn't have that we would want to be able to pass on um, to the next generation, which is getting easier to say, by the way, well, now, now that there actually is kind of like a next generation to, to startup founders, we're seeing yep. people who were born after we graduated university. Yeah. Amazing. Bizarre. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, I, I remember I had it was like 2018 or 2019. So I was a manager. I had an intern. Right. Yeah. And this, this girl was, I did the math. I'm like, she could have been legally my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. yep. Yeah. And, yep. and I'm like, you okay. Be my child. <laughs> and the, I was the like first... 30, 36, 37, I think. And uh, I think she was, but she was very young. She was like 17 yeah. or 18 probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, the, the, uh, the first that, for that me was, was uh, we were at lunch and we had some same thing. <laughs> some, somebody super young, like coming right out of college. And she was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. My dad is turning 40. I have to get him something for his birthday. And I'm like, whoa, I'm older than your dad. Yep. <laughs> I was like, that's some yeah. next level stuff. Uh, and, and after that, I was like, yep, I'm that guy now from, from this point on. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's a lot to digest. So like more than a decade later now, how's the startups.com? Like how's the company structured? How many people do you have? Who yeah. does the engineering work? Yeah. So yeah. Um, th there's a couple of things I think that are pretty unique. And, you know, Ryan, I'd love to hear uh, your perspective of it. Um, so we've got about 200 folks on staff. Um, and uh, we we've been a, a self-sufficient, debt-free, profitable company for a pretty long time now. I mean, at least five, six, seven years. Um, and because of that, we are very, very financially disciplined, right? Again, I'm, I'm our CFO. Yeah. I am in the books every single day, 24-7 around every decision. Um, and, and, and it prevents us from doing a lot of things. I think it's part of the thing like people don't like talk about, right? Yeah. They're like, oh, I guess you guys are successful and you have lots of people. No, <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be shocked at how granular these decisions that we can't make are. And here's why. Yep. We don't have a pot of money that we don't know what to do with, right? Every single right. free cash flow, uh, a dollar, has 10 different places it can go, right? From staffing to marketing to you name it, right? And so for any, at any time with us, um, 
all of our days are spent trying to stack rank what's going to get the next dollar because it's one yep. thing always at the expense of 10 others and when like new folks come on board and they're like um hey can we do this and this and this we're like no we can't we actually can't um you know we we are we are very disciplined and limited and when we get over our skis and we do from time to time where you know um expenses are starting to outpace revenue a bit we have to make hard decisions you know we have to cut staff in some cases fortunately knock on wood haven't had to do a lot of that uh you know this year but you know who knows right um but but we're we're not immune to it right like like real stuff happens and um the economy's down it's down across the board right we have six different products and, and they've all faced some sort of attrition or or hit over the past 18 months it's almost impossible not to so in running this business like we have to respond to that really quickly now if you have a whole bunch of cash in the bank like a lot of my friends do or did <laughs> they, they used to <laughs> yeah. um you can do things differently you can say hey you know let's even you know let's, let's keep hiring going even though it looks like some macro trends aren't working because we want to be able to work through this and there'll be more capital yeah. on the other side <clears throat> except there wasn't yeah. right and now everybody's getting cleared out right Right. So we want to talk about uh, your your podcast a bit, because yeah. um, I think we will soon start running out of time. Um, so your podcast is amazing. I mean, thank you. Uh, since I discovered that episode, I've been binging on it. Uh, I also <laughs> like that your episodes are fairly short. I think it's like thirty to forty five minutes yeah. usually. Yeah. So I could actually, I did find myself like I went on a walk. I started listening to your to your episode. It was that Woodstrap versus VC back company episode. And well, guess what? I made my walk twice longer because I wanted to. Yeah. The, uh, You're the welcome. It, you know, NPR calls this a driveway <laughs> moment when you like come to your garage. And but they you wait in there, and you yeah. wait for your podcast to finish. You don't go back. Yeah. Home, I, I love that. I love it. It was, yeah, that was hey, my Ilya? sort of driveway moment. Yeah. Hey Ilya, how old are you? I'm 39. I will be 40 this year. Ah, okay. Uh, Arnab, how about you? I'm 42. Okay. Well, then you guys, you guys missed the cup. Uh, there's an episode called "The Curse of the 37 Year Old Founder." which was yes. essentially the story that I told you guys. And, and, and I was hoping you weren't going to say 37. There's this weird thing, and I don't know why it's a thing, where everyone seems to have this crushing life moment at 37 as founders. And a lot of it has to do with life stage and things like that. Yep. If, you ever got, right. if you guys ever get a chance to go back to it, it, it is both a cautionary tale and probably one of the, the, the realest moments that you'll be able to relate to uh, you know, okay. uh, as, as an adult. Yeah, I think before you go into the podcast, I think both of us probably faced a bit of that midlife crisis. I guess that's what it yeah. is, right? Yeah. And uh, but we were both in corporate jobs, and we were just yeah. like, you just can't can't. I mean, like you know, we're high paid, you know, all the status and brands and all that. Yeah. But it's like you just can't keep doing this. Yep. Uh, yeah. At some like, point, you gotta do it for you. For. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It exactly. took a few years, but I think we finally figured out how to like untangle all of that. Now it's the next phase is how to keep doing this for a yep. long time. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a long-term investment. Like a lot of times, you know, Ryan, you and I work with people all the time, and they're like, you know, I want to get into the startup game. I want this thing to be self-sufficient within the next couple of years. Of course, totally yeah. agree. It just doesn't actually work like that. Like, right, right. you know, what you think is only going to take like a year or two takes three or four or five years if you're lucky. If it works, you know, um, yeah, and then yeah. it takes ten years to really build the thing that you actually thought would take three, and that's fine, by yeah. the way. Um, it's just a long period of uncertainty and grind, and that's a right. lot for people to get through. Right. Yeah. Maybe it's uh, it can be compared to raising a child. So it's yes. not like you're getting a baby born and you're like, okay, so yeah. <laughs> I wish I wish uh, you know he got eighteen like in two years. Right. Right. right exactly. No, it, it does take time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Then the minute it gets 18, you wish they would go back again. Yeah, so be careful yeah, yeah, what you yeah. wish for. <laughs> yeah. There are definitely times that we've been through this. You know, there were there were times, I think every business goes through these life cycles where there are periods of like pure joy and excitement and build and chase and it's all adrenaline. And then you get to these points where like it becomes a little more operational and it, right. it's that's kind of like now now your kid's 14 or 15 and they don't right. need you in the same way that they did. And you show up with the, the toys and the games and they're like, no, we don't want to play like that anymore. Right. It's not right. how this business works now. And you're like, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think that's one of the fortunate things in, in our case. We've been able to reinvent the business so many times to, to, to keep it fun and exciting. I think, you know, the, the most recent version of that would have been. Um, well, the podcast was one of those things, right? Yeah. So to, yeah, to yeah. a little bit back to the podcast, um, the podcast uh, breathed life back into both of us where it was like it gave us this new amazing outlet that was not just creative but cathartic. And yep. and then we were seeing the reflection from the community, how much it was helping people. Those things feel amazing and, yep. and, and, and kind of bring youth back into it. 
And then our founders group accelerator product, um, which like as you build product, as you build software, as you build platform, you get further and further and further away from your user base in a real sense, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. there's these abstracted layers of value between you and, and the people you want to help. Um, so bringing that back down to a very human product, in addition to all of the scaled software and, and education and tools that we have, was amazing, yeah. right? That was a rebirth for, for all of us where we'd rolled up sleeves back into one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many conversations with founders that completely changed, you know, how we interact with that customer base yep. that we love so much and just brought us back to the fold. And, and, and made us a ton of new friends. You know, yes, we, right. we, when, you, when you spend a, a whole bunch of time with a founder, often at their darkest moments, you know, in their mostly dark moments, let's call it what it is. Yep. Um, <laughs> and, and you're the guiding light that kind of guides them out of that. That's a big deal. Um, it's a great yeah, way to build a relationship. Right. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you guys are able to share any numbers in terms of like how many listens you get uh, and kind of what role does the podcast play? in the whole kind of overall marketing story. I know it's therapeutic for both of you, but like from the business yeah. side of things, like, like what, what's the, what's that impact of the, of the podcast? It's been interesting and it's been, it's been much higher than we would have expected. Mm -hmm. When you, when you look at the relative numbers, it doesn't compare to some of the other things that we do in terms of overall reach. The depth of the reach is incredible. We've yep. realized that there's something that there's around a, a 40% coincidence rate with people who have joined our accelerator and people who were podcast listeners. It wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. the podcast that, that pushed them into it. But when you talk to people who've listened to the podcast, they feel like, and a lot of them have binge listened to like 200, well, we get these emails all the time or, 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 yeah. or reviews or whatever, where it's like, I binge listened to the entire series in a week. And I'm like, I'm not even sure that well, they must have listened to it on two speed. I'm not sure that's even possible. I think there's more hours in a week. Yeah. Anyways. Um, and so what ends up happening is this relationship forms. And I think this is an important point here because I don't think that will always be true with any podcast, right? I think because of the deeply personal nature, yep. because of the deeply emotional stuff that we're talking about, the existential crisis, um, it it brings people close to us in a way that a how-to podcast wouldn't, Yep. right? And so I think that there's, there's something really interesting about that. And so in our particular case, with the podcast that we have, the audience we have, and the way we've chosen to deliver it and stuck to it because we've been given lots of advice. This is the other thing. We could have had more reach with this podcast a lot if we had more, taken yeah. on guests. We could have had yeah. more reach with this podcast if we had decided to maniacally run around the country and, and get on everybody else's podcast. But we said that wasn't exactly what we were about, and yep. we've stuck to the guns. And again, the scale, not massive, but the impact has been huge because of this coincidence rate with the, the people, the, the trust relationship that it builds. It's been something mm -hmm. absolutely magical where people feel like they know us. Yep. Here's the other thing that's been cool, Will. I'm sure you've experienced this as well. You get on the phone with somebody who you know has spent 200 hours hearing some of your <laughs> deepest, darkest thoughts and moments. Yep. Yeah. You don't have to play warm up with that person. You're no. like, I know you know me and I know enough about you given that you spent 200 hours listening to me. Yep. We right. can just jump right in. And so like these bonds happen really, really quickly. It's been incredible. Right. You know, I, right. I think maybe a way I could summarize that, Ryan, is to say the podcast doesn't bring us customers. It brings us friends. 100%. Mm. I agree. Right. Actually, right. actually so, I, I can definitely relate to that experience. We recently talked to someone who listened to us from the very first episode. Right. So sort of our super fan. He's probably listening to this right now. Yeah. Um, and in the very beginning of the meeting, so yeah, we met with him um, uh, over uh, Google Coffee. Meet. Oh, no, no. Uh, yeah, 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 it was yeah. Uh, on, on the video. Mm -hmm. And he's like, it feels awkward because like, I don't know so much about <laughs> yeah. you guys. And, yeah. and you like know nothing about me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, you know, when in the early, early stages, we were probably maybe 20 episodes in. Uh, we had done an episode about how um, a founder is incredibly lonely because nobody relates to us. We, we can rarely go to our spouse and tell them what's actually on our mind because there's consequence there, right? Like they make, oh, wait, we're running out of money or like, oh, my God, like, you're, you're, you know, uh, whatever. We, we often can't go to our co-founder because they're like, wait, yep. you're second guessing whether you want to do this, right? <laughs> we can't talk to people at cocktail parties because they're like, what do you do again? Right? They don't care yeah, Dude, 30 years, <laughs> at all. 30 years later, my family still thinks I do something, quote, in computers, right? Like, yep. <laughs> connected they are. Of all the things that I've done for 30 years, I have no idea what I do, right? It, which is fine. But, but you, you start to look around, and this doesn't become incidental. So we get this really long email from a listener. This is one of the first ones that really struck me. And he said, uh, I, was, I was doing a cross-country trip with my fiancé. And we started to binge listen to your podcast uh, while in the car. 
And she said, at some point, she looks over, and I'm completely in tears. And she's like, are you okay? He's like, this is everything I've been trying to tell you for like the past year. Like, this is exactly how I feel, right? Yeah. And I was like, damn, right? Yeah. As good as our, our pop-up ads might be on a landing page, nothing evokes that kind of response. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> no. Right. Like, you want me to join your mailing list? My God, that speaks to me, right? Like yep. night and day, this is this this is not comparable to, to like customer acquisition whatsoever. It, you've built right. a friendship and there's nothing like it. Right. I love the style of like free flowing, natural conversation, but also the topics are like you said, they're therapeutic to like listen to. So yep. you mentioned that you tried out like some guest episodes and had some horrible <laughs> experiences. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah. Uh, so, so the first one was Steve Blank, right? I don't know that Steve knew we were on the podcast. Do you remember that? <laughs> I, I, I do. And it's so funny because it was one of those, one of those situations where we got the email of like, you know, we, we'd love to, to have, uh, it, we got an email from, I think maybe the first one was from Steve, but then it quickly turned into Steve, talk way, to my people. Give some yeah. context. Steve Blank, the book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it, customer discovery, right? So he, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the guy is an absolute expert. You know, if you want to understand customer discovery, Steve Blank's your guy, right? Yeah. And, and a very, right. very well, well known entrepreneur um, has done a lot of things, but probably best known for, for customer discovery. Um, and so we get the, we get the email back saying, you know, okay, talk to my people. And we're like, oh, okay. So we talk to his people um, and we give the, the ethos of the show, the fact, you know, this isn't a how to, we don't want to talk customer discovery with Steve. We want to talk about his journey as a founder, where right. the ups and downs were, all these things. And I think we had, we had some topic. I don't remember what the topic was. We're like, this is what we're going to focus on. And what we got instead was Will and I sitting in stunned silence while we got a 30 minute breakdown of customer discovery process. <laughs> 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 like, well, that didn't work as we had hoped or intended or even encouraged. And when it was right, done, right. I was like, I actually don't want to publish this episode. Like, I feel like an a-hole because we have a massive amount yep, of respect right. for Steve. Yes, um, massive. But it had nothing to do with our podcast whatsoever. And so right. we tried a few others. Uh, do you guys know who Sam Parr is? He, he has a, a My First Million podcast. Um, yeah. And this was long before that. Uh, Sam was doing a, a, a business called The Hustle. And yeah. Sam's been a friend for a long time. And I had Sam on. And Sam ironically started basically doing the the My First Million podcast, basically like what he wanted to do, right? On the episode. This is before his podcast. And he's like interviewing me and asking me how much money I have and all these. And I'm like, oh, what the hell is going on? Yeah, what happened? Yeah. Like, yeah. This doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so we had good guests and it did not take us long. We only had like what, like three or four, right, Ryan? Like we had good, good guests, but yes. um, we realized it wasn't the format. Like the, it the, doesn't work. No yeah. sense. Uh, there's a whole thing where you have to have guests in order to increase your distribution because ideally they'll share what you do. Totally get it. Totally get it. It just made for a shitty show. So you know, right. uh, we're we're stuck on our own fame, which is very very minimal. Right. Yeah, that I think it cool. was it was an interesting exploration to go through, right? And I think yeah. that if you right. were to look at those, if anybody else listened to those episodes, I don't think they'd be like, "This was a horrible podcast," but it wasn't startup therapy. We had done right. enough episodes, and I'm so glad that we didn't try that early on, Will, because I think yeah. it may have completely changed the trajectory. We might have been like, well, this is what the podcast is. Right. If we had just stuck with the guest show where we were just interviewing entrepreneurs, then I don't think that – I know it wouldn't have had the impact. Nobody would be crying right. over an interview that we did with Steve Blank. Right, right? exactly. Um, we would be. Nobody. Yeah. We, we did. We both we had, to, we had to have two episodes after that just to talk about how to not do guests anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. But I think it was an important realization to have and to figure out, again – to Will's point really early on in this episode, what do you not want to do, right? right and and right. sometimes what we say no to is so important to what the final outcome is because by saying no yep. to guests, what we said was yes to a deeper conversation between he and I and yes to being able to provide that value to our audience. And that's super important. So I think that for anybody listening who's planning a podcast, starting and trying to building towards that, one of the things to really keep in mind is how are we going to add that specific value to our customer? Don't try to do everything for them, right? right. Think about who that listener is. What do they need to hear most from me? Yep. What's my unique perspective? What is the thing that I bring to the table they're not going to get from somewhere else, right? Because we could have done a, uh, here's how to market your startup podcast right. and joined right. 70 or 80 others. Yep. Uh, right. We could have done, you know, any number of things. But what we chose to do was the thing that we felt like was very underrepresented and would bring a high level of value to the population. 
and if you're doing it right, it's a lot less effort. I'm, uh, podcasts are hard yeah, work, is. right? But but yep. um, but yep. if you're doing it right, it's because you want to be doing it. Uh, yep. By the way, uh, this podcast here uh, generated two new podcast episodes for us. Uh, here's, here's two new podcasts that you're going to see, and they, they came from you guys on this episode. I wrote these down. Uh, one's going to be called When the Investor Becomes Your Customer. I think that's yep. gonna be a, a great one. I love it. Cover, yep. right? I noted that one mentally. Yep. 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 Um, and then I don't have the, the title here, but the long period of uncertainty and grind. Like, how long is that exactly? When you say, like, hey, Will, it's going to take many years before this thing becomes profitable <laughs> or self sustaining. Can you be more specific? <laughs> Tell me exactly right. what you mean, because I'm in it right. and I'd like to know when it's going to be over um, and kind of go through what those milestones are uh, in the different phases. But this yeah. is what I'm talking about. We just sit around and bullshit with founders all day. And we're like, oh, man, that's a really interesting topic. Let's talk yep. about that. Hadn't thought about that one yet. Yep. Right. Cool. Yeah. All right. So we are approaching time. And um, so we wanted to ask you, I guess, a couple of parting questions, very quick ones. Uh, what, pod what podcasts do you listen per to personally? Because that's actually what we, we have been talking to a lot of podcast listeners recently. Mm -hmm. And that's the primary way people discover podcasts. Yeah. So yep. yeah, recommend something to our listeners. Ryan? So I, I found a, a one that I've been listening to a bit recently called Hard Fork. I'm enjoying yeah. that one. Uh, yeah, that. so that yeah. that's been good. I uh, it, I always get this one wrong. I can never. It's is it the Verge Report? I'm trying to remember the name of the podcast. I don't know about that one. Uh, the Verge Cast. The Verge. I, cast see, the, the problem is there's like there's the Verge, there's the Verge Cast, there's right, the Verge right. Report. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do. I'm gonna have to go back and find out what that one is. I can I can send it to you guys afterwards. I have to remember exactly which one it is. Yeah, we'll Those are good. To the show notes. Yeah. The, the, it's interesting right now. I'm actually not listening to a ton of other podcasts. I really enjoy ours. Um, there are a few that I'll pick up when I hit podcasts. Now it's mostly to like completely unwind or check out. So it's yeah. been things like smartless, uh, or, um, what's the one fly on the wall with, uh, Dana Carvey and, um, oh, geez, I'm doing a great job of, 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 of sharing podcasts today, aren't I? They're clearly very and emotional to you. Very, yeah. very deep. No, they're not. Like these are the things. Like I listen to them as I go to sleep at night, and I, I fall asleep right. to uh, to these to just like basically just like lighthearted stuff. That's what I need right, right. now. Yeah, but I am. Um, no, I mean, hard fork. I completely agree. Like I love that podcast. Too, so. Yeah, it's it's yeah. good. It's good. Yeah, it's it's kind of. I think it's going to become required listening in my household for my entire family. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't listen to any podcasts. I mean, as funny as it sounds, like um, uh. The only one I ever listened to, Ryan, you and I talked about this. I listen to our podcast, and yep. here's what's so funny about this. I, I only not to, this isn't being narcissistic. Whenever we record a podcast, as soon as we hit stop, I have no idea what I just said. I go into some <laughs> weird like hole or whatever, and so I'm yeah. not kidding. Every time when the the podcast actually releases, or you know, it's usually been a while since I I'll, I I only listen to my car, and I'm never in my car. This is why, um, and I'll put our podcast on. I'll start listening. I'm like, damn, that's a really good point. And then I realize I'm yeah. the one making it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's totally like, forgot. Yeah, you know, I used to listen to it because I was trying to figure out how we could get better, right? How our pacing could yep. get better in, in whatever. But now I listen to it because I haven't actually heard the episode, and I'm actually right. like, I'm, I'm actually hearing it for the first time. And right. and I'm and I'm like, wow, like you know, we actually were poignant on our point, or like, man, we rambled for a while. Um, but since I'm never in my car because I work from home and I don't go anywhere, um, I'm, I'm never in a place to podcast it, it, or listen to podcasts. Right. I don't listen to them when I'm working out because I listen to music. I don't listen to them when I'm in my workshop. I'm a huge carpenter, so I do a, a ton of building also uh, because I'm listening to music. So I just don't have a venue for it. But if I ever start becoming running guy or something like that, I'll be all over the podcast. God, oh, that, that if you ever else. become running guy, there'll be more interesting things to talk about. Will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does somebody else do post-production for you or you guys produce your podcast yourself? Uh, uh, we, we, uh, outsource it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We, we did that for about a hot minute and then I realized yeah. I don't want to be an audio engineer when I grow up. And so we, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we, we cut that out really quick. Yep. Will, you'll, us, you'll like this, it, but, but he loves doing that stuff too. So. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Oh, we can, we yeah. can, I mean, if you're, if you need more hobby to, to occupy yourself, we can send you ours. No problem. <laughs> if you, if you run charge. out of cash, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There's that side All hustle. Right. All right. Actually, yeah, that might be a good idea. Um, all right. Well, uh, guys, thanks a lot for uh, your time today. Uh, yeah. I really appreciate it. And this will come out 
next week. We publish okay. on okay. Wednesdays Wednesday. at 3 or 3 a.m. Eastern time. Okay. <laughs> Which is just you after earlier than we do. Midnight. Not much earlier. Yeah, see, I'll okay. be I'll be I'll be awake and ready to go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, be sure to, to email us the links and so forth and uh, and or tag us. Uh, yeah. LinkedIn is a great place to grab me. That's where I've got the kind of the biggest audience, most most available folks. All right, Arnab, this was an awesome episode. One and a half hours just yeah. gone, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. didn't even realize how fast it went. Yeah. Yeah. We actually had to let uh, Will and Ryan go because we, were, you know, we were just at time. Yeah. So we are recording this just by ourselves. Yeah. So one thing we wanted to announce, which we'll talk more about in the next episode, is that uh, so we finally published the book. Yeah. It's called The Pragmatic Podcaster: yeah. A Step-by-Step -step Guide to Starting an Amazing Podcast. Yeah. So that's what the book is about. It's about how you actually follow things step by step. Yeah. Starting from, you know, figuring out what your podcast is about, who is it for, what the persona. Basically, we take the product management approach to starting a podcast and then going into how they record, what software you use, uh, yeah. what microphone you buy. And it's how all, do you get guests? How you get guests. Yeah. yeah. How you actually, how you write a cold email is yeah. one of that, right? Yeah. Uh, how you produce your episode and then how you improve over time. And the reason why I picked that name and the pragmatic podcaster, it's obviously homage to the pragmatic programmer book. book yeah. um, the idea here is that being pragmatic means that you don't do things that are not needed. You do like the 20% you need to get 80% done. Yeah. Right. And then some things you can just do later. Yeah. And being pragmatic. Improve, improve later, yeah. small, little by little. Yeah. Being yeah. pragmatic means being incremental right. in many ways, right? Right. And uh, running a podcast, starting a podcast could feel really overwhelming, especially if you do it all yourself. And uh, overwhelmed, you will not be with my book. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> That's like Yoda. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I watched like 10 Star yeah. Wars movies. Yeah, right before coming here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, where can people get that book? pragmaticpodcaster.com. Right. And that is on Gumroad right now. So you can get like a EPUB version, a PDF version of it. Yeah, you can get the PDF version. I'm still working on the EPUB version. It turned out to be more difficult than I thought. Hopefully by the time we record the next episode, mm -hmm. we actually will have it on Amazon. Amazon, um, Because I just downloaded this Kindle Create software, which is a piece of shit. But uh, you get what you get to do to get on Amazon. Um, yeah. Uh, what else? And you can also get to the book by going to our website, metacaspodcast.com. There is a book link up there now. So yeah, uh, find it there. Tell us how it's going. Send us any feedback you have. Uh, you can reach us at hello at metacaspodcast.com. Yeah. And you can get a 30% discount on the book if you use the code Metacast. Uh, we, need to, we need to make up a code. Yeah, let's use, if you use the code Metacast. Yeah. <laughs> just type Metacast, you get 30% off. It will be active for a week after this episode comes out. Right. Cool. Awesome. And you can always reach out to us at hello at metacastpodcast.com. Yeah. We would love to hear back from you, like you just heard from Ryan and Will. Those long emails, you know, yeah. if you made you cry, yeah. <laughs> tell us about that. Yeah. Um, we would love to hear those stories. I really resonate with that kind of deep connection because that's yeah. how I feel about podcasts. Yeah. Um, and we've well, received a, a few and they have been amazingly wonderful. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Uh, but you also can uh, support us by buying a t-shirt. <laughs> So okay. we have we have some pretty cool uh, Metacast t-shirts on our merch store at merch.metacastpodcast.com. Yeah, we have yeah. Uh, a few there. Um, Minor Podcasting Celebrity is my favorite one. Yeah, that's the one I got to. It still hasn't arrived yet, maybe because I'm in Canada. That's an anti-ad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in the US, I got it in less than a Within a couple of days. Yeah. Not a couple of days, because okay. they actually they print on demand, right? So right. you order it, and they print it, and they ship it. It was probably five business days or so yeah. it was, it was yeah, not, not, not bad. bad not bad not yeah. bad at all all right and then with that we'll Be talk done. to you next week bye bye bye